Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Today's message is freedom. Now, here's Bill on that. Atop of a hill in Washington, D.C., stands a building, the Capitol building. And this cornerstone for the Capitol building was laid in 1793. And it wasn't until 70 years later, in 1863, that the building was finished and the crowning touch was put on top of the building. Anybody know what's on top of the building? Maybe. The statue called Freedom. This is a color picture. The one on top of the, the building is not in color, but it helps us to see a little bit easier. This is the statue known as Freedom. In her um, left hand, she carries a shield with the stars and stripes on it and a wreath. In her right hand is her sword. She wears a, uh, a helmet with an eagle on it, and 13 stars go around her head. She is 20 feet tall. And I know it's not polite to talk about a lady's weight, but she weighs seven and a half tons. She was forged in Rome, and on the trip across the Atlantic Ocean, they ran into some storms and some weather. And the captain ordered cargo thrown overboard to lighten the ship. And the sailors wanted to throw freedom overboard because she's pretty heavy. And the captain said, no, never. We will flounder before we throw away freedom. And because of that one man who stood for freedom... We have this statue. Coming up this week is July 4th. And we think about freedom. And the kind of freedom that we have in this country. But not just the freedom that our country gives us, but the freedom that God gives us. What is our freedom in Christ? So before we start talking about freedom, I want to talk about three kinds of freedom that I, I thought about while I was working on this sermon. So hopefully you've got out your sermon notes. Um, we can talk about some of these real quick. So there's, there's these, these three types of freedom, almost phases of freedom that sometimes we move through. The first one I call freedom of. Freedom of. And this leads us to our Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments. Okay? Remember when the Constitution was being sent around in um, 1787? to our original 13 states for ratification, people were concerned about their freedoms. And so we started putting together our first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, and these are the things that give us freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of the people to peacefully assemble, freedom of religion, right? And these are the things that we think of a lot of times when we think about the U.S. and the freedoms that we enjoy. Paul tells us in Romans, he says, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. And 2 Corinthians tells us, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? When we have leaders who are in the spirit of the Lord, they've invited the Lord into the work, what do we get? Freedom. I tried to think about what our Constitution would look like if it had to go through our leadership today. And, you know, Congress and the Senate all worked on it. What would we get? I don't know but I think it would be a far cry short of what we have. Because th these people were, that were our founding fathers invited the Lord into the process with them, and the Lord directed them, and that gave us freedom. So we have freedom of. 
The second type of freedom, or sometimes phase of freedom, would be freedom from. And that's, I want freedom from everything. I don't want any constraints on me. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it. I want anybody telling me I can't do it. Right? And I not only want that, I don't want any consequences from what I do. I want to smoke a cigarette and not get lung cancer. Right? And this is where we find a lot of people in America today, I think. Right? I want to do what I want to do, and I want you to tell me I can't do it. I want freedom from. And we have some people who want freedom from religion instead of freedom of religion. Then we hear anybody say the word God around them. Freedom from. Kind of reminds me of a text in the Old Testament, Judges. It says, in those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Could you imagine what our society would be like if everybody did what they saw fit? No laws. We just do whatever. I can't even imagine the freeway, right? Imagine if they took all the lines off the freeway, took all the stop signs down, all the stoplights down. You just could drive wherever you wanted to do, do whatever you wanted to do. It would take, like... 20 hours for me to get to work because it would just be a disaster, right? We need some amount of structure and laws to get along, okay? Freedom from is not always a good thing. It's been observed that we have a bill of rights, but what we need is a bill of responsibilities because sometimes we don't want that. We just want freedom from everything. I don't know if you guys watch the TV show, The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Don't raise your hands. I don't want to know. I'm very proud that I have never watched that show. Um, but apparently, in this recent episode, this made the news, um, The Bachelorette, I guess she's a Christian, and I guess one of the bachelors on the show was a Christian, and they were talking about premarital sex. And... Um, she, he was asking her if she'd had premarital sex. He said that he had, but, you know, he was now saving himself for marriage. And this is what the bachelor had answered. And I quote her exact words. That's not how it works. I can do whatever. I sin daily, and Jesus still loves me. It's all washed, and if the Lord doesn't judge me, it's all forgiven. Okay. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want anybody telling me any different. Okay? It's prevalent in our society today. And then the last type of freedom or phase of freedom is one that we don't often get to. And this is freedom for. I have the freedom for doing ministry. I have the freedom for telling somebody else about Jesus. I have the freedom for putting some love on somebody that needs it. I have the freedom for being merciful to somebody who needs it. We don't often get to that stage. To reach out with people. Jesus himself says in John, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Right? This is where true freedom comes from. This is where true freedom comes from. I don't know if you guys saw the movie The Patriot from some years back. It's a fictional story of Benjamin Martin and his family's involvement in the Revolutionary War. And the movie opens... And in kind of the opening sequence there, Benjamin Moore says this, uh, Martin, I'm sorry, Benjamin Martin says this line, I have long feared that my sins would return to haunt me. Because this was not the first war he had been in. He had been in the French Indian Wars. And while he was a war hero, he regretted some of his actions in that war. 
And he was afraid that his sins would come back to revisit him. How about you? You have the same fear? Somehow we are afraid of something in our past coming back. When God gives you freedom, you are free indeed. Not for a day, not for a week or a month or a year or a lifetime, for an eternity. That's true freedom. Okay? So, we have these types of freedoms. And sometimes we struggle with what to do with freedom. Right? And, and Paul is, let's be honest, confusing as heck sometimes. Right? Because he says, don't be a slave to sin. Be a slave to righteousness and be free. You're like, wait, how can I be a slave to righteousness and be free? That sounds the opposite. And you know why we don't get it? Because we're stuck in freedom from. And we think it's all about being free of any constraint. And so we don't understand what he's talking about. So there's a couple of freedom principles I want to talk about today. Just three things. There's probably a bunch more. But these three things should get us started. How to be free in Christ. Freedom principle number one. Rest in what God has done for you. There's a prisoner in Sydney, Australia who wanted to escape. I suspect all the prisoners want to escape, but this particular guy uh, worked out a deal, and when the bread truck came into the prison yard, he crawled up under the engine somewhere and found a place to cuddle up and hide. The truck drove out and drove down the road, and I can't imagine how hot it must be in the compartment of a bread truck in Australia. But I, it's got to be pretty warm in there, right? Truck drives for what seems like a long time for him, finally stops, the motor turns off, he crawls down and out. You know where he found himself? In the next prison yard a few miles down the road. <laughs> and that's what happens to us when we try to obtain our own freedom. When we think we can do it all, we can take care of it, where do we end up? In the next prison a couple miles down the road. That's not freedom. That's not freedom. Right? And, you know, it, it almost seems un-American for me to tell you not to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Right? That's what we learn here in America, you know. The cowboy that solves the problem and rides off into the sunset and is the hero, right? The lone guy. Well, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. That's Hollywood fiction. The way you find freedom is by turning it over to God and salvation and enjoying what he has done for you in his relationship. Revelation 1.5 says... And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his what? By his blood. Where does our freedom come from? Not because some founding father wrote something down on a piece of paper. That's not where our freedom comes from. Where does our freedom come from? From Jesus and his blood. Yeah. Right? Freedom principle number two. Respond with a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. When you figure out eventually that you are free, what are you going to do? Go home? Sit on the couch? Yay, I'm free. I hope not. Right? How many have been watching the Ladies' World Cup? Bunch of us. 
When America wins, like they've been doing, which is really unusual in soccer, what do you do? Apparently, you cheer, right? We're happy. Jump up and down. We cheer. We yell. We, we celebrate. And that's just a soccer game. How much more should we be celebrating when God has set us free? Respond with a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, understanding freedom is a little bit like flying a kite. What do you need? Two things. What do you need to fly a kite besides the kite? Wind and a string, right? What happens? The wind blows, the kite pulls against the string and goes up, 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 right? As long as there's tension from the string, the kite goes up. What happens if you're careless and you're wheeling out the string and you let it just spool off and fly away? Does the kite continue to fly? No. It falls and tumbles. Ends up in the trees like Charlie Brown. The kite only flies when it is held by a constraint. A constraint lifts it higher. What constraint is going to lift us higher? Our faith in the Spirit and Jesus and Christ. The Spirit is what is going to lift us higher, right? We are never free until we are restrained by something that lifts us higher. Freedom is not freedom from where I am free of all constraints. Freedom is where I am constrained by something that lifts me higher. If you were drowning in a pool, would you want freedom to do what you want to do? Or would you be happy for somebody to reach in and lift you higher? Right? Paul says that when we live this kind of life, we will see the results of it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We see people that have these kinds of lives. We realize that they are free in what Christ has done for them. They have a constraint in their life, but yet it's made them free. The um, Scottish novelist George MacDonald wrote, and I quote, Free will is not the liberty to do whatever one likes, but it's the power of doing whatever one sees ought to be done, even in the very face of otherwise overwhelming impulse. There lies freedom indeed. How many times have you known you should do something to help somebody? Maybe a friend needs some assistance, and you think, man, I should help him. But you don't want to. Women's World Cup is on. I'd rather watch that. Right? But you do it anyway. You go and help your friend. That's where freedom lies. When you do what's right, even when you don't feel like it. Even when you don't want to. Even when you're tired and the bags are under your eyes. That's where freedom lies. Now, we have to be careful with this because sometimes we, this is like, it's a very narrow path. Because we can say, well, I'm free in Christ. I can just do whatever I want to do, right? Like the bachelorette. Or we can say, I don't have to do anything. I'm free in Christ. I go home and be a couch potato and just, you know, watch World Cup and nothing else. Right? And both of those extremes are incorrect. But there's kind of this narrow path in the middle of being free in Christ and doing some things. Right? The Bible tells us that faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. Right? So we have to do something, but we don't do things to earn our salvation, right? That's salvation by works. We don't believe in that. So it's weird. You're supposed to do stuff, 
but you don't do it to earn salvation. You already have salvation. And, you know, you can kind of drive yourself crazy with that stuff. And so it's, it's kind of this narrow path of where we need to be. But when you meet somebody that's mastered it, it's insanely obvious. You ever met one of those people? Like, man, that dude's living in the spirit. He's got it nailed, right? It's plain as day when you meet somebody like that. Last freedom principle, number three. Reach out by becoming a contagious Christian. When we are free, we want other people to be free too, right? This is why America goes and helps other countries fight wars, because we have freedom, and we want other people to have freedom too. There was a chime that changed the world on July 8, 1776. The Liberty Bell rang out from Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and it called the people together for the first public reading of the Declaration of Independence by Colonel John Nixon. Now the Liberty Bell has a very interesting story. Real quickly, um, it was a commissioned by the Pennsylvania Assembly in 1751 in honor of the 50th anniversary of William Penn's Charter of Privileges. Now William Penn, we know, right? Who was William Penn? Pennsylvania? I forget, you guys see, I learned all this stuff in history class because I lived on the East Coast. They taught you guys about the Spanish-American War and you didn't learn anything about this. Okay. We're gonna start at the beginning. You guys remember British? No. So, William Penn was given Pennsylvania, right? And he wrote what was considered the Constitution for Pennsylvania before all the states ratified our current Constitution, and it was um, their Charter of Privileges. And William Penn was a very forward-thinking individual, okay? He believed in um, the rights of citizens to be involved in enacting laws. He wanted people to vote on the laws. I mean, this was unheard of at the time. Okay? He was very forward-thinking in his rights for Native American Indians. Um, his Charter of Privileges talked extensively about freedoms that people should be assigned. Okay? Very for a lot of his ideas out of that Charter of Privileges comes into play in our current Constitution. Okay? So the Pennsylvania Assembly ordered this bell to commemorate on this 50th anniversary of this. They ordered this bell. So in, <clears throat> excuse me, in... Um, they took a text out of the Bible to put on the bell. And this text comes from Leviticus, and it says, Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. This was a perfect text of the Bible to put on this bell, because this is what the bell's for. Right? And it was even better than that, because the text before this says, um, Remember the 50th year, it's the year of Jubilee. So this is talking about in, in um, Israel's day, you know, seven times seven plus one, the 50th year, everything went back to its original owners. So if you had given away part of your family land um, to pay off the debt, in the 50th year, it came back to the family. If you were a slave to pay off a debt, in the 50th year, you were set free. Okay? And so every 50th year was the year of Jubilee. And so what better way to remember this charter of privileges on its 50th year than with the sentence that says, the 50th year is the year of Jubilee to proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Beautiful, right? So they cast the bell, they hung it, and the first time they rang it, it cracked. Apparently they don't test the bell, the bell at the foundry before they hang it. They took the bell down, they, re they melted it down, added some copper to make it stronger, put it back up, rang it, and nobody liked the way it sounded. 
because copper bells sound very different than cast iron bells. So they took it down again and tried for a third time. And finally, in 1753, um, the bell was hung. That's the current bell that we have. And we know this bell has been very important because it rang for the First Continental Congress in 1774. It rang for the Battle of Lexington and Concord in 1775. All things you guys should be looking up this afternoon if you haven't heard of this before. <laughs> but its most resonant ringing was on July 8, 1776, for the first reading of the Declaration of Independence. And there is great disagreement about where the crack first appeared in the current bell that we have. We do know the last time that it was rung and the crack expanded and made the bell unringable anymore was on George Washington's birthday in 1846. And did you know that at 2 p.m. Eastern time, children of the descendants of the signers of the Declaration of Independence get together and symbolically tap the bell 13 times for the 13 states that originally ratified our Constitution. And the purpose of this bell rings out from Leviticus to proclaim liberty throughout the land. And what a shame that that has been relegated to a bell instead of us. Because I think God wants us to proclaim liberty throughout the land. And not just the liberty that our Constitution gives us, but the true liberty that comes in Christ. No matter where we live in the world, no matter how old or young or tall or short or male or female, skin color, how much money's in the bank, it doesn't matter whether you're free or a slave. It doesn't matter. You can have freedom in Christ. And we should be telling everybody that, right? Romans 3 says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. To who? All who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. How much did it cost you? It was free for you and me. It wasn't free, but it's given to us as free. The outbreak of the Revolutionary War, American statesman Patrick Henry issues a very famous line. Anybody know it? Give me liberty or give me death. No other option. We will be free or we will die. New Hampshire, their license plate still says live free or die. You take their freedom seriously, New Hampshire. And this became the call for the revolution. It was our motto. They take their freedom seriously. And as Christians, we should take our freedom seriously, but also joyfully. It's our freedom in Christ, right? We celebrate not only as a nation founded on freedom, but as a people who have discovered what it means to be free in Christ. There's no other viable options. Freedom from doesn't work. It's only when we have freedom for where we find true freedom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the freedom that you give us, Lord. We're thankful for the freedom we get in this country. But far beyond that, Lord, we are grateful for the freedom that we have in you. The freedom that allows us to be truly free. A freedom that lifts us higher and higher and higher. Lord, I just ask that you help us understand what that means. It sometimes can be a little weird, a little bit hard to figure out. Help us to understand that, Lord, and help us to live a life 
that truly represents freedom in you. Help us to be a light to those around us so they too could say, I want to have that kind of freedom. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.